Okay, rolling. Okay. Action. So, brothers, I want to start off by offering a correction, another correction to the heresy of oneness Pentecostals. Many of you might have seen a video by Brother Ishmael who uh, put out a, a video um, where he was baptized in the name of Jesus. I baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Just want to talk about baptism and I want to talk about why as Christians we should not be baptized in the name of Jesus and what I mean by that is literally that people are baptized and when they go into the water they say I baptize you in the name of Jesus and then pull you out now it must seem very strange thing for a Christian to say that you shouldn't be baptized in the name of Jesus especially when the fact that Anyone who's familiar with the book of Acts knows that the book of Acts repeatedly states that people are baptized in the name of Jesus. And it does it again and again and again. Now, why is that? Very simply, it's because 2,000 years ago, writing material upon which the New Testament was written was papyrus. And papyrus was expensive. It was an expensive exercise to write. And so as a shorthand, Luke, when he was writing his second book to Theophilus, used as a shorthand to be baptized in the name of Jesus, referring to the authority of the Messiah for the idea of baptism. However, as we know, from the Gospel of Matthew, we read the following. It states in the Gospel of Matthew, in, in fact, I don't even need to go to the passage. It states that the disciples met with Jesus and Jesus said, go out into all the nations of the world, teaching and baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That was the commission, and to make disciples of the nations. Meaning that it is an obligation of Christians everywhere to evangelize, to baptize, and to disciple. That is the mission of the church, one of the missions of the church for sure. So why then, when we get to the book of Acts, do we hear about baptizing in the name of Jesus? As I say, it's done this way because the writing material that Luke was writing on was expensive. It was an expensive thing to write and Luke had been commissioned by Theophilus to write an orderly account of all the things that Theophilus already believed. See Luke chapter 1 verses 1 to 4. Now, as an evidence to the fact that Luke understood baptism, to be in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, I draw your attentions to Acts chapter 19, verses 1 and 2. Okay. And 3. Yes, there we go. It happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus and found some disciples. So he had found some Christians. He had found Christians. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, No, we have not even heard there, whether there is a Holy Spirit. Now think of the question and think of the answer. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So these people are ignorant of the ministry and the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Now think about what Paul says next. No, we have not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit, said the disciples. And he, Paul, said, 
Into what were you baptized? Now think for a moment. Why, when Paul encounters Christians who do not know about the Holy Spirit, the first question that comes to his mind to ask is, into what were you baptized? Why is Paul connecting the idea of the Holy Spirit to the idea of baptism? Now, at this point, the oneness Pentecostal heretics might say, ah, it is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's what they're talking about. It's this spiritual encounter of the Holy Spirit coming in and renewing your lives. That's, that's what the oneness Pentecostal will say. However, listen to how the disciples, listen to how the disciples answer the question that Paul asked because that tells you how they heard the question in the first place. They said, we have been baptized into John's baptism. So they understood baptism to be the submersion in water and the rising out of water, to be covered in water. That is what baptism means. It comes from the Greek, I'm probably going to mispronounce the Greek, baptozoi. The very first time that baptizoi, and I might be getting the Greek wrong here, I'm doing it from memory, was used was in a cookbook 200 years before Jesus about how you make pickles. And the idea was that you submerge them in ointment or that you dip them in ointment, that you dip them in oil or salty water, that you submerge them. So that's our very first use of the word that we translate as baptism. And these disciples that Paul were talking to understood baptism when they heard the question, unto what have you been baptized? They referred to John's baptism. And we know that John was baptizing in water. So we know that it's not talking about just the spiritual experience of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, but it is talking about the act of dunking in water, of submerging in water, of covering in water. But notice the connection. Paul has connected the idea of the Holy Spirit to the idea of baptism. Why would he do that if he had been baptizing in the name of Jesus? Why would that be relevant? I'll tell you why because Paul was not baptizing in the name of Jesus. He was baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, which now when you think of that, suddenly means that his question makes sense. When he said, have you received the Holy Spirit? Because in his mind, the connection is that baptism in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is intrinsically connected to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Now, it is true in Acts that there are those that receive the Holy Spirit before they are baptized. That is true. However, the connection between baptism and the Holy Spirit is established in the verses. So it makes sense then what we have with Acts and what we see in Matthew 28. And if you have been baptized in the name of Jesus alone, as many oneness Pentecostals are, or as many erroneously are in ill-disciplined and ill-formed fellowships, your baptism is invalid and you need to be baptized again. However, my evidence doesn't stop there. I have here a book of the earliest Christian writings. It's a collection of the earliest Christian writings, and one of the earliest Christian writings is the book of the Didache. The Didache is the teaching of the Twelve. Along with the writings of Clement Alexandria, the Didache is as old as the New Testament. It is a first century document. Now, what does the Didache 
do about baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and baptizing in the name of Jesus. Listen carefully to the didache. Okay, in section 4A of the didache. Sorry, let me uh, just get the right passage. Sorry, gone to the wrong bit. So, in section 7A of the didache, that's, that's part 7, section A. Now, it says this. The procedure for baptizing is as follows. After repeating all that has been said, immerse in running water in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That's what the didache says. So our very first, earliest example of Christian practice written immediately after the New Testament says to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Now, what else does it say? It says in section 9a, um, sorry, let me go on. So, now, as it has just talked about baptism in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, just to demonstrate that saying baptizing in the name of Jesus is a shorthand, the didache does exactly the same. It has just said that the formula for baptizing is in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But then it says in section 9, part... E, no one is to eat or drink of your Eucharist, but those who have been baptized in the name of the Lord. So therefore, it is using a shorthand between baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and baptizing in the name of the Lord, meaning that the evidence is sound that the proper means of baptism is to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And if your church is teaching you anything different, it is teaching you a grievous error in contradiction to our Lord and to the practice of the earliest Christians. Now, I have been to Christian fellowships where they have baptized in the name of the Father and in the name of the Son and in the name of the Holy Spirit. That is an erroneous baptism. There is one name shared by Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That is the name that you are baptized in. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Not in the name of the Father, and in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. There are many abuses of baptism going on in the churches because many fellowships have disconnected themselves to Christian history. You need to reconnect. Now, if you are a cultural Christian, someone who has been baptized as a child and you have come to your faith again, you do not need to be baptized again. One baptism is sufficient. The creed that I have defended that talks about the Trinity says one baptism, not multiple baptisms. It is an, a sacrilege to be multiply baptized every time you feel my earlier baptism wasn't sincere. You make a mockery of the idea of baptism. And I want to say to you, because I've had a number of people write to me recently saying that they have just become a Christian and they want me to help them to be baptized. And I want to say to any of you who hear my voice, who have come back to the faith or have recently become Christians, that you should be baptized. Our Lord himself said that to be saved, that those who are saved are those who believe and are baptized, but those who are condemned are those who do not believe. Now it is clear 
from the prisoner on the cross that you can be saved without baptism. And Jesus himself says that it is those who do not believe that will be condemned, not those who are not baptized. But Jesus says that those who believe and are baptized. So Jesus expects that you will be baptized. He commands that you will be baptized. And if you are a disciple of Jesus, you need to be baptized. Because if you don't, you're not being a true disciple of Jesus. He commands it. Why would you do otherwise? So I encourage you, if you are someone who has got to that point in their personal spiritual journey and you want to commit your life to Jesus Christ as your Lord, your God, your Savior and your King and you wish to follow him and be his disciple, then find a fellowship of Christians who are devoted to prayer devoted to the apostles teaching, devoted to the breaking of bread, the sacraments, and devoted to the fellowship, living life together. Sit with them, study with them, count the cost of being a disciple as Christ commands that you should, and then put yourself forward for baptism. And please share your joy with us. Send uh, a picture or a note or an email telling us that you've been baptized because of the work of Soko Films so that we can share in your joy. The baptism is a public declaration of your discipleship unto the Lord. It is a way of witnessing that you wish to be a Christian and I encourage you to be baptized if you believe and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Any questions? I have a question. Go on. Shamsi is running. Shamsi is running. Shamsi is running. Where? How many times have we seen Shamsi running? Call him. I'm right here. I'm call him. I'm right here. He won't come. He'll run. Yeah, we're going to put you on for camera. Don't touch the camera. Which one? Not cutting kids. No, no, you watch the video, yeah? yeah. Did I cut? Yeah, uh, which one? Title. Yeah, you said it. Yeah, you said it. Shamsi! No one's scared of Shamsi. Shamsi Gonzalez. Shamsi runs away faster than Speedy Gonzalez. All right, question. Okay, here, Go on. So one of them, there were some churches that believe that baptism must be a full immersion baptism, not like there are the more older traditional churches, I believe, that the sprinkling or the covering of the head is sufficient. Is this something that you either agree or disagree? And I have a question, not necessary to the topic that you were speaking about, hopefully you don't mind. The idea of predestination, do you believe, if you don't believe in predestination, are you still a Christian? Okay, so I'll answer the second question first. I believe that if someone believes in predestination, they are a Christian. I believe if someone does not believe in predestination, they are a Christian. I see this as a secondary matter. Okay. I'm not going to say I'm not going to work with a Calvinist just because they believe in predestination. And the Calvinists themselves, to my knowledge, do not dismiss Armenian Reformed Christians who don't believe in predestination. So this is an entirely secondary matter. And furthermore, just going back to the Didache and what it says about baptism. The procedure for baptizing is as follows. After repeating all that has been said, immerse in running water in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. If no running water is available, immerse in ordinary water. This should be cold if possible, otherwise warm. If neither is practical, then pour water three times on the head in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The reality is that the earliest church practiced both forms of baptism, so both forms of baptism are completely valid. Completely valid. The Jews used to baptize male converts who had converted to Judaism. 
And after they had given them the snip, the men and their households were all baptized and they were submerged in water. So the normative practice of baptism is to submerge. But in the absence of that possibility, the pouring of water is a totally valid way to baptize. Now, furthermore, in fact, there is no furthermore. I think that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Any other questions on baptism? Infant baptism, for or against? Infant. Infant baptism. Personally, it's, personally, again, I think it's a secondary issue. The reality is that the church has baptized adults and baptized children from the earliest days. When a household was baptized, when the Lord of a household was baptized, him and all of his house, as it says in the book of Acts, that would have included his wife, it would have included his children, and it probably would have included all of his servants and all of his servants' families. The reality is that the ancient church and the ancient world did not think in the individualistic way that we do today. There are entire tribes in different parts of the world, in Latin America and in Africa, who have a collective sense of identity, not an individualistic sense of identity. An individualistic sense of identity is a European way of thinking about identity. There are entire groups and tribes in the world that if the chieftain was baptized, it would make no sense that not everyone else would be baptized as well. If the chief is baptized, if the elders of the tribe are baptized, it makes sense to them that they should also be baptized because that is how they understand their identity. In the medieval world, it was understood amongst peoples that if the king had a faith, you also had to have that faith. And that continued for thousands of years, for nearly a thousand years, up until the 16th century, when that connection was broken. And so this idea of individualized baptism is a uniquely Western paradigm. It is dominating the world, it is changing the world. But the reality is there are many peoples that don't think as individuals. And we must not confuse individuality with Christianity, because those two things are not the same. Any other questions? Some evangelists, I believe, they, they believe in the uh, born again sort of the philosophy that you, you got together the secondary uh, baptism. So, the question is, certain evangelicals believe that you need to be baptized again. I want to say that evangelical Christians are my brothers and sisters. And as Christians who are Catholic, and Protestant and Orthodox, there are things that we don't agree about. This idea of a secondary baptism is one of those issues. I do not find any evidence in the scriptures, nor in the early church fathers, nor in the practice of the church to support the idea of multiple baptisms. It is a modern thing to be baptized multiple times. It started, I think, if my history serves me correctly, with the Mennonites, the Anabaptists, who broke the connection between being born into a Christian family and baptism, and first introduced the idea of believer's baptism. Now, I'm not going to say that someone who believes that isn't a Christian. I just think they happen to be in error on that particular question. And we as Christians have to allow the space amongst ourselves to allow that we might be wrong on something and not judge one another by a particular opinion on a secondary issue, but to unite around the gospel of Christ, that there is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that the divine Logos became a man of the Virgin Mary, was crucified for the sins of the world, that rose again and conquered death and is returning in judgment for the living and the dead. And that there is one church, holy, Catholic, apostolic, 
that seeks to serve Christ that is not bound up in any denomination. Any other questions on the issue of baptism? Before I move on to my other talk. Okay, Shams is not coming because Shamsi is a coward. Shamsi runs all the time. But I want to say this, I'm going to move on to my other talk. 